يقول سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بعد ان اقول اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم فبما رحمه من الله لنت لهم ولو كنت فظا غليظا قليلا فضوا من حولك فاعف عنهم واستغفر لهم وشاورهم في الامر فاذا عزمت فتوكل على الله ان الله يحب المتوكلين ان يصركم الله فلا غالب لكم وان يخذلكم فمن الذي يصركم من دونه وعد الله فليتوكل المؤمنون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا اله الا الله اللهم اجعلنا من الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر امين يا رب العالمين سوره ال عمران the third surah of the quran deals with several subjects but one particular subject has been given a lot of space in the surah and that subject matter is the accounts and whatever happened in the battle of uhud and uhud as many of you know is the second major battle in the madani life of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam there are a lot of things to learn from these accounts and that's why allah dedicates a lot of ayat to this subject and you know that every ayah of the quran offers us guidance so allah doesn't just tell us what happened but he tells us what happened and what you can learn from it what us as muslims can learn not just in that particular situation but what universal lessons are we going to take from that and make our own lives better forever to come so the quran is not just a book of history it's a book of timeless instruction timeless counsel and timeless guidance so it is in that spirit that i want to share with you something very particular that we learn about the prophet himself sallallahu alaihi wasallam in dealing with a difficult situation how the prophet as such was being taught himself he is our teacher sallallahu alaihi wasallam kama yaqul subhanahu wa ta'ala wa yu'allimuhum al-kitab he's the one that teaches you the book so he's our teacher but he himself has a teacher sallallahu alaihi wasallam and that is allah azza wa jalla and you know the best thing to do as a teacher is to find the right opportunity to teach a lesson so the opportunity of uhud as terrible as it was and if so many of you don't know the details and maybe some of you don't know the details of what happened in that battle i won't give you too many details here because this is not the place for it but i'll at least share with you some of the accounts so that you have an idea of where we're headed here it was a tough situation of battle earlier on allah says wala qad sadaqahu wallahu bi idnihi wa ba'dahu yattaqusunahu bi idnihi allah was fulfilling his promise when you were annihilating them you were making them feel the heat of battle by his permission the muslims came ready and they were destroying the enemy on the battlefield and they were winning and this is the commentary of allah himself that you were making the enemy feel the pains of battle in the middle of the battlefield now a lot of you know in a battle in a war there are a lot of different you know situations it's not just one fight going on there's a fight going on over here one over there one over there there's strategic locations and every location has its own importance the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had appointed in every major group a battalion if you will of soldiers every battalion has their own leader because the prophet himself sallallahu alaihi wasallam can't possibly lead every group so he has to appoint you can call them sub managers so if he's this the ceo or the general of this army he has to appoint certain lieutenants in each position and that's important and by the way when you appoint a lieutenant it means you've given them confidence and obeying the lieutenant when a soldier obeys the lieutenant it's the same as the soldier obeying the general there is actually no difference if a soldier says in the army hey, i don't have to listen to you you're just a lieutenant i'm going to go listen to that general that soldier is actually court martial because that's destroying the discipline of the army you can not everybody can have can go up to the top just like a lot of you work in organizations you work in corporations by guesses and you have a manager and then you have up above the corporate ladder somebody who's a ceo or a regional director or somebody people who are in your team when they have an issue they don't go to the ceo they go to you and if they skip you and go to the top well they're destroying the structure of the organization and hurts the organization itself it undermines the hierarchy of the organization to make sure that we understand that as muslims the prophet ali sallallahu alaihi wasallam says man ata'ani faqad ata'a allah whoever obeyed me actually the fact of the matter is they in fact obeyed allah there's no difference between obeying me and obeying allah wa man ata'a amiri faqad ata'ani and whoever has a, a, obeys the one i appoint if the prophet appoints somebody sallallahu alaihi wasallam a lieutenant whoever obeys him is the same as obeying me is the same as we 
chain because that's the chain of command. That's the discipline structure you have to have in an organization. And there's no tougher organization, no stricter organization than the military. The military is probably the, the most disciplined form of organizational structure there is. And that discipline is critical because it can be the difference between life and death. When a, soldier, when a lieutenant tells a soldier, go over there, and he you know, goes one foot over this way or that way, it could be the death of the entire command. It could be the death of the entire, you know, that entire battalion. So discipline is of key, like life and death importance in the army. Now, the Prophet ﷺ appoints a certain a number of uh, sahaba, companions, to the top of a hill, and they're supposed to be in modern, those of you, the younger folks here, that's the modern warfare sniper position. Okay. So they're, they're set up there as archers, so that if the Muslims are attacked, they can keep the, the security view, they can see from all angles, if the enemy is coming from behind, they can watch out for him, because the higher position you can see in every direction. So he appoints them and he gives them instruction, you shouldn't even come down, even if you see birds eating from our corpses, bottom line. In other words, no matter how bad the situation gets on the ground, you shouldn't come down. And the instruction, even though the Prophet himself gave these instructions, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he left somebody in charge. He left a lieutenant behind. When the Prophet leaves, who's in charge? The lieutenant. Now, look, it looked like, according to what Allah says, it looked like we were destroying the enemy. We were destroying the enemy. And these archers, some of them, 35 out of 50, some historians say, they said, look, the Prophet said that we should go down, even we shouldn't come down even if they're eating from our birds or eating from our bodies. But this is the opposite. We're winning. We're not losing, we're winning. We should go down. You know? And the head of the battalion, the lieutenant, says, no, we should stay. He says, no, we should stay. So now there's a difference of opinion in interpreting what the Prophet said. Some say the Prophet didn't mean we should stay in every situation. We should just go down because it looks like we're winning. And the other says, the lieutenant says, no, my interpretation is we should stay. So 35 out of 50 disobey him. They disobey him. Thinking, what's the big deal? We're only disagreeing with him. It's not like we're disagreeing with the Prophet himself. But that was their idea. So they come down. And as they come down, Khalid ibn Walid, who wasn't a Muslim yet, but he was a genius in political and in military strategy, sees them coming down and sees an opportunity. Fifteen archers on top are not going to be enough to hold them down. So he makes a gigantic U-turn and attacks the Muslims from behind, and the tide of the battle turns. Allah captures that entire failure. A lot of stuff happened. They came down, they messed up, we got attacked from behind. The whole scene, the tables were turned upside down, it looked like we were winning, and now it looks like we are losing and we're being destroyed. The one phrase in the Quran that captures that is hatta ida fashilto. Small phrase. Until you fell loose. Al fashil bin Arabi al Quran in modern Arabic fashion is failure. But in old Arabic fashion is to become loose. The idea is loose in discipline. You guys loosened up your discipline. You can't afford to. And you started arguing with each other. You started pulling at each other in what the right command should be. Even though there is a hierarchy set. And you disobeyed. You disobeyed after you saw what you love. The soldier sees you know, swords and shields lying on the battlefield. Those are the spoils of war. Those are the things you're going to pick up and they can be your property. So he sees them and he, you know, he runs towards it. But some some Mufassir would interpret Matakitun meaning the Sahaba loved victory. For Islam, they didn't just want the swords and the shields. They saw victory, so they ran towards victory. But anyway, the point I want to make is it turned the tide of the battle. Things got really tough. So tough that the Muslims had to retreat. And as they're retreating, and in this, in this chaos, by the way, the Prophet was hit so hard, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that his tooth fell out, and he fell unconscious. And when he woke up, his mouth was filled with blood, and he saw blood all, his own blood all around him. And he was really, really like, the rumor even spread that the Prophet has been killed. You know, this rumor spread in Allah. And, when, and you can imagine people are fighting, dust is rising, you can't see clearly, you don't know what's going on where. And when this rumor spread, the Muslims were in chaos. All kinds of crazy things. And then finally, eventually, when it was known that he hasn't been killed, there was a secure security line around him, and they escorted him up a mountain, because the horses of the enemy couldn't follow up the mountain. The Muslims were retreating up the mountain, and the Prophet is still left on the battlefield, and he's saying, calling them back. Calling them back. This insane situation occurred. 
You know, 70 of the great shohada were killed. It was the exact opposite of what happened in Badr. In Badr, 70 of the greatest leaders of Quraysh were killed. The opposite happens in Uhud. 70 of the great shahada of the Sahaba of the Muslims are executed. They're shahada. Now, in the middle of all of this chaos, does the Prophet have a right to be upset? This, my khutbah is not about the Battle of Uhud. It's about something about the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Does he have a right to be upset? He yeah, absolutely has a right to be upset. But this Sahaba, what did you do? How did you leave your position? Didn't I appoint him as my commander? Where are you supposed to listen to the chain of command? This one mistake cost lives. It cost lives. It cost the Prophet ﷺ his tooth. He fell unconscious. He almost got killed in the battlefield. His uncle dies in the process. I mean, this is not something small. And you know, when you suffer losses, you get upset. But when you suffer even the loss of loved ones, as a result of one of your people's mistakes, you have every right to be extremely, extremely angry. So now there's going to be a meeting. The meeting between the Sahaba, especially the Sahaba who failed, who made a mistake, and the Prophet What are the Sahaba expecting you then? Oh man, that's not a meeting you want to go into. That's not a, you have, a lot of you, you, know, you, you work in corporate, you have a project due, you missed miss the date by like three weeks, and you're being called to the office. You know what you feel like? Oh, that's not going to be good. So some of you are students, you don't hand in your paper, and the teacher says, can I meet with you after class? You know, how your, your heart gets overfilled, like, oh my god, my life is over. You know, this overwhelming feeling. Now imagine these Sahaba have to go meet with the Prophet But before they meet with the Prophet Allah reveals, tells the Prophet how to deal with them. That's the ayah I want to share with you. This is leadership. Leadership in tough situations. فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ هِنْتَنَا That it is especially because of the incredible and incredible mercy from Allah that you are lenient towards them. You know, there's some things that the English translation of the Quran just can't capture. لِنْتَ لَهُمْ فَلِنْتَ لَهُمْ بِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ هذا هو ترتيب العالي بالدعاء the normal sequence is you, you say you are lenient towards them because of Allah's mercy. But in Arabic when you say فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ Then you say لِنْتَ لَهُمْ What that means is it is an unusual mercy from Allah. It's not something normal. No normal leader can do this. But you are the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You enjoy a special mercy from Allah and that's when the ma is before, and then there's the ma. Because in Arabic you can say, فَبِ رَحْمَةٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ Allah says, فَبِ مَا رَحْمَةٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ The ma is called مَا تَعَجُّبْهَا It's shocking how merciful, how powerful the mercy of Allah is on you, the Prophet ﷺ. It is such a huge mercy on you. What's that mercy? That when you deal with them, لِنْدَ لَهُمْ You are lenient and soft. You don't even come across as upset. You're talking to these sahaba that cost lives. And you're going to deal with them, and they're not even going to feel like you're angry. You're lenient towards them. You're soft towards them. SubhanAllah. That's a very difficult thing to do. Especially in the battlefield. Now, I, we're talking about the battlefield and leadership in the battlefield. Before I go on with the, the rest of the ayah, which is incredible, really incredible. All of us, we have to understand, if I ask a question, you're not supposed to answer questions during a khutbah, but I'm asking rhetorically. How many of you are in leadership positions? You know the answer? All of you are. All of you are. A father is in a leadership position, and a manager is in a leadership position, a mother is in a leadership position, an older sibling is in a leadership position, you know? Even the youngest sibling has other people in his class and school that are younger than he's a role model whether he realizes it or not. And as Muslims, Allah has put us in leadership positions because we're supposed to be examples to others. All of us are in leadership positions. So when the Prophet is being given instructions in the role of a leader, and he's being told how to deal with disappointment, how to deal with people that have failed you, how to deal with people that didn't do what you asked them to do, that have made you upset, that have caused you harm, that we have to take these instructions not as something for the Prophet himself وسلم, but what kind of leader am I when things don't go my way? You know, in the college there's an MSA and the MSA president says, please make the flyer and have it printed by this day. And the guy says, I forgot, I had a midterm, you know. 
And of course, there was a finals game last night, so I just I couldn't, I couldn't find the time to make the flyer. And he gets really angry, bro, come on, man, I rely on you. The event is in like two days, you haven't made the flyer, what's wrong with you? No, 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 he didn't tell him, just a volunteer. He doesn't need your attitude. You need to be, you need to learn from the promise leadership, If in that most incredibly difficult situation of life and death, the Prophet is commanded to be lenient, what kind of leaders are we going to be? He says, And if you were rigid in speech, is soft, easy going. Fault is tough, rigid, scolding. He, he, from, the, from his face, you can tell what he's going to say is going to sound like thunder and lightning. I can't believe you guys did this. You know, what made you do this? Answer my question. You know, is some, a teacher is getting angry at the students. How could you fill the exam? How could you have done this to me? That kind of yelling maybe comes from your boss when you go in to work. Maybe you're the boss and you're the guy that does it all the time. You know? Fault one. If had you been tough, you know, harsh mouth. You said mean things all the time. You are hard of the heart, meaning you are insensitive. It's in Arabic combines two things, very interesting word. One, it combines toughness. And mostly in Arabic literature, it goes back to the heart. So somebody who doesn't, it's not very sensitive, not very soft hearted. But Lilla also means hard toughness for your own protection. In other words, he's tough because he wants to get his job done. He doesn't care about what, he, what anybody else needs to get done. My project, my work needs to get done, and you fail, so it's your fault. So you're, in, in some sense, you're selfish when you have Lilla. You're just concerned about yourself and insensitive to the problems and the shortcomings of others. Do you think the Sahaba already feel guilty even before the Prophet opened his mouth? Absolutely. And a sensitive leader would already know that. He would, he would already know, look, these people, they made a mistake, but look at all the sacrifices they made for me before. They're not prophets, they're going to make mistakes. They're just human beings. And all of this that they've done, and they haven't been paid for it, they've done this out of the goodness of their heart. So I need to appreciate the fact that as we go, there will be bumps along the road, some bigger than others, and I can't be hard with them. Now listen to this incredible ayah, what Allah says to the Prophet First of all, it's a special mercy from God Himself that you are so nice to them. Second, if you were harsh and you were mean to them, then Fabbu bin Hawlik, the English translation says, they would have run away from you. They would have dispersed from you. The question is, who would have dispersed from you? The companions of the Prophet. The companions came to Islam because Islam is the truth. That's what we're told. They came to Islam because Islam is the truth. They were convinced that it's the truth. They were convinced of it. But Allah says, and even though the Qur'an is still true, and the Prophet is still the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and that is the best of all generations, even if all of that is the case, if the only one difference was you were a mean, rude leader, even just that one difference, everything else is still the same, the Sahaba would have run away. <laughs> How important is the niceness of a leader? That the best of all generations, according to Allah Himself, would have run away from the Prophet if he was harsh, if he was tough. It is not my word, it is the word of Allah. How can we undermine the importance of the character, the demeanor of leadership? How are you supposed to be with people who work under you? Even the Sahaba, the greatest of all generations, were being told they would have run off. They wouldn't have been able to handle it. So when people quit, Working, volunteering for the masjid because the president of the masjid yelled at them. I don't know the president. I don't know the story. Don't tell me. I don't know. But he quit. I don't want to work there anymore. The teacher quit from the Sunday school because the principal yelled at her. You know? People leave. They don't want to deal with it anymore. And you say, oh, they don't, they don't want to serve the cause of the staff. That's why they left. Well, actually, you're pretty obnoxious. They're pretty tough to deal with. And if the Prophet is being told, Sahaba wouldn't have been able to handle a bad attitude, you can't blame the people. You can't blame the people. We have to take these people as gifts from Allah, the ones who serve in any capacity. And the mistakes come along the way, regardless, they're gifts from Allah. Now, the most incredible thing. I told you, the English translation says they would have run away from you, yes? And in the law, that's the word used in Arabic. In Fadla. In Fadla in Arabic is actually used when glass breaks. You know, you drop a glass of water and the, the, the small pieces of glass, they spread. Can you put the glass back together or no? 
No, it's impossible. The word used, let me go, la farru. They would have run away. They would have run away. He says, in fadlu. In other words, they would have, the group would have been cracked and dispersed in a way that you could never put that unity back together again. The thing that is holding the unity of the Muslims together is the leniency and the patience and the love of the Prophet sallallahu as a leader. Can you imagine the value of leadership? Imagine the value of the leniency of the leader, the patience of the leader. Especially when dealing with disappointment. Being a nice leader when things are going well is easy. The test of leadership is when your followers disappoint you, when they mess up. That's when the test is. And that's when if you don't do your job, the group, the effort will break, and it will break in a way that can never be recovered again. Then fadlum and hawlik. This is Allah holding a meeting with the Prophet ﷺ before he holds a meeting with the Sahaba. Let me prepare you for your meeting. Let me have a meeting with you first. So how should you deal with them? He's about to go meet with these Sahaba. How should you deal with them? Allah tells him, here's what you need to do. Three steps. Number one, fa'fu anhum. Then lovingly forgive them. There's no point dwelling on the past. I know you feel guilty already. Look, let bygones be bygones. It's over. I don't hold it against you. Mistakes happen. It's okay. <coughs> forgive them. But my uncle, no, forgive them. But 70 Muslims died, forgive them. I gave them specific instructions. How could they not listen? Allah says, forgive them. Let it go. That's what you have to do as a leader. That's leadership. He has all the reasons not to forgive. Allah says, no. You? Because it's a special mercy from Allah? First thing, fa'afran. And al-afu in Arabic, let's say al-afu in al Forgiveness is with the one who has the, the, the nobility, the dignity, the ability to do so. So the Prophet ﷺ, as a matter of his status, the fact that Allah has granted him leadership, is in the biggest position to be forgiving. The higher you are in leadership, the more forgiving you should be. فَعْفُ Forgive them. Let them know that it's, it's, it's in the past, I'm not going to bring it up again. But then, it may be that in a public meeting, the leader says it's okay, it's done. I don't hold it against you anymore. But the heart still has a feeling inside like that guy really messed up. I mean, I'm saying I forgive him, but every time I see him, I remember what he did. You know, every time I see his face, I'm reminded. So it's not like it was before. Huh? There's a crack in the relationship, and that crack is deep down inside the heart. It doesn't come on the tongue. It doesn't come on the but it's in there. So how do you get rid of that? When you are by yourself, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what should you do? وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ Ask Allah to forgive them. When you make dua for yourself and your family and this ummah, pick the people that disappointed you and make special dua for them. That's how you will know nothing is left in your heart. SubhanAllah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And by the way, I added in private moments, on purpose. Because when somebody disappoints you, and you have a meeting afterwards, and you say, no worry, I forgive you, and may Allah forgive you too, then that's not forgiveness, that's humiliation. You don't say to somebody publicly, may Allah forgive you. You don't do that. You go in private. When you talk to Allah for yourself, when you talk to Allah for your forgiveness, that's when a leader asks for the forgiveness of his followers. It's the exact opposite. You're being back to being rude and mean again. When you publicly say, Ya Allah, may Allah forgive you what you have done, no. You know. That's not, that's not what the case is. This is how you make sure that the leader has nothing left in his heart. But there's another last problem. Such a beautiful problem. The last problem is, what if the follower has something left in his heart? The one who disappointed the Prophet said, man, I messed up. He used to listen to me, he used to value me, he used to respect me. I know it's never going to be the same again after I've messed up. I mean, how can it be? I know he says he forgave me, but come on. How, it's impossible for him to get rid of that from his heart. How are you, as a leader, going to convince your follower that it's okay? It is as it was. We have mended paths. So there's a crack in the leader's heart that's been mended. But now there's a crack in the follower's heart. That needs to be mended. So Allah's Messenger is told, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Wa Shawirhum fil Amr. Ah, Ajmal Hadal Kalam. Consult them when you make decisions. The people who disappointed you, when you're about to make a decision, now who's making the decision? The Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Does he need anybody's input? No. 
ما ينطقوا عن الهوى. He doesn't speak on his own. He gets what? He gets revelation. He doesn't need further opinions. He gets opinion from Allah. But Allah says, in order to make your disappointed followers, your disappointing followers feel like they're special again, before you make a decision, make sure you ask their opinion. So they feel like, well, the messenger asked me what I think? But I just messed up last week. It must mean he values me again. He respects me again. He has love for me again. Just the fact that you considered and you asked. And by the way, Allah didn't say, Talaha. Pretend that you're asking their opinion. Don't really ask their opinion. You know what we do in Shura, right? What's your opinion? Jazakallah <laughs> khaira. Like before he gives his opinion, you say Jazakallah khaira. That's not Shura. When the Prophet is being commanded, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's, 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 this mushawara is absolute. In other words, genuinely, I know my time is up, I'll take one more minute. Mushawara and Hunkar absolutely seek their consultation in the most genuine way so they feel valued again. And even though they, they have given, your, given you their opinion, you will still be the final verdict. You will still have the final rule. فَإِذَا عَزَمْتَ مُفَدْ When you, by yourself, make the decision, after considering all the options, فَتَوَكَّنْ عَلَى اللَّهِ Then put your trust in Allah. The last comment I want to leave you with. We were talking about, you know, and, and I was thinking about this for several reasons. And one of the most common of which is the elections are around the corner. And in politics, you know what they do? They blame the problems of a country on the leader. It's under his leadership, this happened, this happened, this happened. So it must be his fault. Or under my leadership, this and this and this will happen, so I'll take credit for it. So the leader wants to take credit for everything good happening, and the opponent wants to give him all the blame for all the bad things that are happening. That's happened, that happens with leadership. But you know what Allah says? No matter how good a leader you are, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi there's not going to be a better leader. There will not be a better leader. But no matter how amazing a leader you are, Victory and loss do not come from you. The very next ayah says, إِنْ يَنْصُرْكُمُ اللَّهُ فَلَا غَالِبَ لَكُمْ وَإِنْ يَخْذُرْكُمْ فَمَنْ لَلَّذِي يَنْصُرُكُمْ مِنْ دُونِهِ If Allah was to aid you, no one can cope with you. <coughs> Victory doesn't come from the leader. Victory comes from Allah. Don't blame your leaders. How from Allah has an arrived. See, Allah puts the right attitude in place right when you need it. Right when you start thinking victory and loss comes from leaders. Allah puts us in the right attitude. SubhanAllah. May Allah Azza wa give us the ability to implement qualities of this leadership in our household, with our wives and our children. May Allah Azza wa make us good leaders as teachers, good leaders as people that are in charge for different aspects of the community. May Allah give this kind of, put the, the, the love of following the leadership practices of the Prophet into the hearts of every one of us so that we can lead better family lives, better community lives, and run better Islamic organizations. الحمد لله وكفاه والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم